Welcome back, everybody, to Chapter 4, The Age of Revolution. We are looking at the making of Assassin's Creed, the 15th anniversary. Assassin's Creed Unity. As ambitious as Assassin's Creed Unity was upon release, the initial vision was in fact far grander in scale. The title was intended as something of a reboot of the series, built for the new consoles that were on their way. Like everyone, Ubisoft wanted to really make a splash with this brand new and more powerful hardware. It was being developed by the team that had worked on Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, released back in 2010, which meant that the game had been in development for almost four years by the time it came to release. That's a long time. Assassin's Creed Unity was always going to be a big, technical step forward and serve as a benchmark of what next-gen gaming could look like, who he remembers. Even when I was working on Brotherhood, I remember seeing some target gameplay footage of Unity, and it absolutely blew my mind. McDevitt adds, It was definitely the longest Assassin's Creed project that had ever been in the works. It was very, very ambitious in those first years. In fact, for quite a while, creative director Alexandre Arancio, or Amancio was pushing for the game to just be called Assassin's Creed. Obviously, that didn't happen, explains Travis Stout, who was the lead writer on the project. In the end, we dropped the number from the title, so it wasn't Assassin's Creed V Unity, it was just Assassin's Creed Unity. The idea was that we were starting over on a new console generation, and he wanted it to be a clean slate for the whole franchise. The plan was to start fresh to try to get new fans on board, people who perhaps didn't have seven games worth of backstory, and knowledge that they would have to get caught up on. In some ways, Unity was a return to the core of the Assassin's Creed franchise. It was an open world game that gave the player a beautiful, sprawling city to explore at a viable and an interesting time of history. The final version of the game centered on the French Revolution, but the initial plan for Assassin's Creed Unity was far more ambitious in scope. Right at the start, the game was supposed to allow the main character to travel between four different time periods within the same game as Azazium remembers. There were going to be medieval France, these were going to be medieval France, revolutionary France, the Belt, Belle Epoque, and the Second World War. What's more, each period was going to have its own protagonist, and ultimately this idea was dropped for a number of reasons. When development started, four years until the release seemed like a long time, McDevitt explains. But when you're that ambitious, you learn quickly that actually, this idea needed eight years to be done right. In the end, the team scaled the concept back to just the French Revolution. He continues, The problem with four time periods is that you can say, Oh, we'll just do these small districts. But there's still a floor that you can't go below. If you're going to create even a small amount of the Bella Epoque, you need to create all the costumes for the characters, all the art, all the sound, all the voices, all of the buildings. Even if it's going to be just one city block, it doesn't matter. There's a bare minimum you have to do, and it's unreasonable. Azazia adds, When we started to work on the engine itself and get into the technical feasibility of the concept, rather than just dreaming, we realized within the first couple of months that it wasn't possible. Not only was this concept a challenge on a technical level, it was also a difficult circle to square from a pure game design perspective. It was a technical nightmare, but narratively it was even worse, as Azazia remembers. How do you explain things like your weapons? When you move from the medieval period to World War II, does your sword just turn into a gun? What would happen? The studio decided to focus on the French Revolution as the game's main setting. Partially, this was done because that was the period that would resonate best with a global audience. We did a lot of consumer testing in the U.S. I spent a lot of time in New York explaining and showcasing iconic elements from the French Revolution, 
Alan Uris says. Things like the guillotine, the flag, though that didn't exist at the time. People were partially aware of this, but the French Revolution was the best or easiest time period to choose to talk about French history. We could have gone with Napoleon. We did discuss Charlemagne, but the French Revolution was the best choice, not only because of the events at this point in history, but because it influenced other revolutions around the world. It was iconic enough, but not too French-centric. The idea of multiple time periods might have been dropped for the main setting of Unity, but they did make it into the final version of the game. We had what were called time anomalies, as Azimi says. You spend most of your time during the French Revolution, but there are flashbacks to medieval Paris where you can see Jacques de Molay being burned alive, or Paris during the occupation of World War II, Paris during Belle Epoque. These were all designed on paper to be fully, fully playable. The initial idea of having multiple time periods was partly tied to some ambitions that Ubisoft had had for the modern day framing of Assassin's Creed. With Desmond dead as of Assassin's Creed 3, the crew had been working to create what was called Initiates, a web-based platform that would have connected everything related to Assassin's Creed. While Initiates did actually launch, it was more of a community hub than a platform. The team wanted this game to introduce the idea that the player was the modern-day hero, McDevitt explains. If you're a member of Initiates, you'll get a lot of extra cool present-day stories fed to you during the game. One of the ideas was that periodically during Unity, Abstergo locates you and sees that you're mucking around in protagonist Arno's memories. They try to kill you. And so, you have to escape that simulation and jump into some other parallel simulation of Paris. You escape by going through the Bella Epoque or by going through the Middle Ages. And then you jump back out and that buys you time to continue Arno's story. So that was my proposal for reusing these assets that had been created. A Revolutionary Hero Helming Assassin's Creed Unity was Arno Dorian, the son of an assassin. Arno was raised by a Templar after having been orphaned by one Shea Cormac in Assassin's Creed Rogue. In part, he was a reaction to some of the criticisms that Ubisoft had received over Assassin's Creed 3's protagonist, Ratten Token. There was a sense, rightly or wrongly, that Connor from Assassin's Creed 3 was not particularly beloved by most of the fan base compared to someone like Ezio, Stout remembers. There was definitely a sense that we wanted to move back to a less reserved, less stoic, and a less stiff protagonist. Though the fans clearly loved Ezio, the narrative of the team wasn't in a rush to do, just do another version of this character, but this time with a French accent rather than an Italian one. The idea of that to us was boring, Stout says. We'd already done three games with Ezio, so at least for me, a lot of Arno's character was crystallized in the very first scene where you see him as an adult. You've seen him get his father's pocket watch from his body. That is clearly a very significant item to him. Then we cut to him in the game's present day, having gambled that pocket watch in a game of cards that he was absolutely certain that he was going to be able to win. That moment solidified the idea that this character was ridiculously overconfident and thought that he could just bulldoze his way through anything. That aspect of the character was emphasized partially because that's how a lot of people play video games. But it was a challenge to make this work within the context of a video game. I think that was a fun thing to do with a video game, protagonist Stout explains. A lot of the time, that attitude would mirror some of the player's experience. We've all had that moment of playing a game, whether it's Assassin's Creed or some other game, where you jump down into this group of ten guards and think you'll kick their asses, but end up being wrecked. I wanted to bring a little bit of that to Arno. It was a tough line to walk, because on the one hand, it was an interesting character dynamic, but on the other hand, video games are very much a power fantasy, and we didn't want to make the character feel inept or clumsy. We tried to find that balance of making him a little too confident in his abilities, while also fulfilling the player's fantasy of being the elite badass, assassin, fighter, sneak thief, killer guy, etc. Similar to Black Flag's Edward Kenway, Arno is somewhat disconnected from the Assassin Brotherhood. I wanted to do a character who wasn't particularly motivated by the Assassin's philosophy, Stout says. The Assassins are pretty much a means to an end for him. His primary thing was that he felt deeply, deeply guilty for thinking that he had gotten his adoptive father killed. He was a little less ideologically motivated, but I also didn't want Unity to purely be a revenge story. 
Arno's story was never about getting revenge on the man who killed his adoptive father. It was about trying to make amends for his own perceived failing. A different revolution. The decision to depict the French Revolution came with its own challenges and the team had to tread a bit more lightly this time around when it came to the history of the period. The French Revolution might have occurred over 200 years ago, but there was still a degree of contentiousness about how it should be presented. Whenever people talk about the Founding Fathers and the American Revolution, they tend to agree on most of the elements. There aren't necessarily two visions of the past, Durant says. However, current politics in France are still based upon interpretations of the French Revolution. There are left and right ends of the political spectrum, but they have other names that are based on how the political system was created during the French Revolution. It's still very much alive in their minds, and how history is taught in France is very important. Azazia adds, there were more debates than we ever had had in the past because of the way we chose to portray some of the historical characters. We ended up showcasing figures like Robespierre. In France, he is still heavily debated. Robespierre was a revolutionary, but at the same time, he had a pretty rough history. He had people, including scientists like La Viesseur and journalists, executed because he felt they were too moderate. That's quite hardcore and intense. Thus, we depicted him as not being a very nice guy, which of course led to a lot of discussion in France. As is always the case, the Ubisoft team turned to experts in the time periods they were setting games in. They did this both to pick the experts' brains and to discover whether or not they were on the right track. For Unity, this included Dr. Jean Clemet Martin. Ubisoft also avoided what had internally been described as the Forrest Gump effect from Assassin's Creed 3. This was the tendency for the main character to be present for almost every single important event from the historical period. With Unity, history was going to be a backdrop for the story. We realized that steering away from historical events gave us more opportunities to offer creative missions and to make the best Assassin's Creed game. Truly, it felt like trying to give a better sense of the time period was going to be more important than just sticking to certain historical events. As Asia continues, aside from the very beginning of the game, where we see Louis XVI give a speech at the Estates General, the rest of the game is really about Templars and Assassins. In Assassin's Creed Unity, we try to look for events that people may not have considered quite so iconic, like the Cult of Reason ceremony, where Robespierre gives his big speech about how they're going to rebuild France as this logical, philosophical reason nation. A lot of people, at least those outside of France, didn't really learn about this in their history education. It was very much an in intentional decision to not have Arnaud stumble into every major figure. Even when we did go to the big events, it was always serving as a backdrop to what Arnaud was actually doing. It was never a case of Arnaud having to protect someone so that they can reach the place where they make a famous speech or something. Instead, it was focused on Arnaud's actions and in the background, Robespierre is giving a speech or Mirabeau is doing some political maneuvering or something. That's not to say that Unity shies away from the history of the period. As always, players rub shoulders with important and powerful figures from the era. The game as a whole is just a very different entry in the franchise. Unity's story is also a much more individualized one. Primarily, Arno is trying to exact revenge on the people who killed his adoptive father, so he can find his own redemption. Arno doesn't really have strong feelings one way or the other about whether the Templars or the Assassins are right or wrong. Stout explains. He mostly wants to redeem himself and be with the woman he loves. It's a very personal story for Arno, McDevitt says, but you still meet a lot of people like Napoleon in the main story, and then the next time you encounter him is during a side mission. Unity's gameplay was a real return to the original Assassin's Creed. In fact, it was intended as a soft reboot of the franchise, one that returned to the series' roots and which didn't concern itself with the wealth of new gameplay mechanics that had been introduced in more recent iterations. The thinking was that Black Flag was going to be the last legacy game from the previous iteration, as AZ remembers. Unity was literally built on our new engine. It was going to be an entirely new flagship game. 
What stood out from development was that we were tackling so many different subjects at the same time. In the past, we were able to iterate really quickly with games like Brotherhood and Revelations, but those had been done on the same engine. We knew that tech really well. This was the first time since the original Assassin's Creed where we had Tabula Rasa, an entirely blank slate. We were going to start fresh again, so we wouldn't use the legacy of anything that came before. There was no way we could use naval gameplay or any other features that had been previously developed because we were starting from scratch. The Montreal team was revisiting more or less every aspect of the franchise, even its combat systems. For the very first time in the saga, you could fight multiple opponents, as Asia says. A couple of opponents could attack the player at the same time, rather than just waiting to attack in order. Even fundamental elements, like parkour, were redesigned, pun intended, from the ground up. Players have always had the ability to go really fast when they are ascending a building, as AZ explains. Unity was the first and only game in the series to feature what we called Controlled Descent. That's where you can parkour down a building really quickly. It's probably the best way we use parkour in the whole saga and franchise. Urban Jungle Compared to Assassin's Creed 3's Western Frontier and the Caribbean Sea of Black Flag, Unity took the gameplay back to its more urban roots. For some, this was a welcome return, but after several years of designing worlds, building and filling a city with content proved to be a challenge. The whole game was focused on a city rather than a huge open world, it says. In Unity, we tried to fix so many things in the game. At one point, we lost track of some of the design ideas. If you look at the map, there are tons of activities and things to do, which was an issue in the end because the map was just full of dots of different colors. What we saw was that players basically picked a destination and stayed focused on the map instead of looking at their surroundings. The game was one of the most beautiful we had ever crafted, and still players were playing just with the radar, which was something we missed. Initially, the narrative was designed to stay away from certain aspects of the Assassin's Creed franchise. For example, the initial plan was not to feature many, if any, artifacts from the first civilization. In fact, there was only meant to be one reference to this part of the series lore. It was going to be a purely human and personal story, Stout says. The only reference in the game was going to be a tiny easter egg located in the first scene where Arno meets Napoleon at the sack of the palace. Napoleon is searching for something and eventually he opens a little box. A golden glow comes up onto his face. It was just a tiny little easter egg for people who remembered that one of the puzzles in Assassin's Creed 2 shared Napoleon with the Apple of Eden. That was originally the only thing we were going to have there. <clears throat> this changed as the gameplay team tried to figure out how to end the game. These developers wanted something more dynamic for Unity's final boss fight. That's why German Germain had the sword, Stout explains, of the game's ultimate antagonist. We didn't really go into how or why he had it, because we felt like it was something that Arno wouldn't have known about or been particularly invested in learning about. It came as a surprise to him. The idea of cooperative gameplay in Assassin's Creed goes all the way back to Prince of Persia Assassins. For a long time, developers have wanted to include this kind of functionality within the main stories of the franchise, but technical limitations meant that this wasn't possible. Instead, co-op components were relegated to separate game modes. With Unity, the team decided to jump headfirst into this kind of mechanic, with up to four players being able to help one another out on specific missions. In fact, Unity was the code name the game was given while still in development for a very specific reason. Since Brotherhood, there had been multiplayer mode within Assassin's Creed, but it wasn't at the core of the experience, explains Alan Eyre. When you launched the game, you had the single player experience on one side and multiplayer on the other. The goal was to unify these two experiences, co-op and single player. One of the reasons that co-op was pulled from the original Assassin's Creed was that it was another demanding feature in a game that was already wildly ambitious. These were titles with huge crowds, a fully climbable city, and the variety of systems that went with such features. For Unity, the team came up with a novel way of handling features, like the massive crowds of non-playable characters. Crowd replication was a huge technical issue, as Asia says. When you play the game, there are literally hundreds of people on the screen. The thing is that you should have the exact same crowd on the screen at the same time. 
It's meant to be four players versus the environment. The way replication works in order to save memory is that we know the position of NPCs on screen, but we don't know what they look like. This means that if one player is hiding in the crowd, my friend might see that I am near two doctors and one courtesan, but on my screen, I would see different NPCs in that exact spot. For various gameplay reasons, it's super hard to have the same thing displayed for everyone at the same time. Unlike Assassin's Creed games since Brotherhood, Unity didn't feature a typical multiplayer mode. This was something that was planned for the game, with a system where players would be able to create their own avatar for these segments of the game. But as with a lot of the more ambitious ideas in that project, it was just not possible. Players are going to be able to design their own avatar, male or female, McDevitt says. The team went down that path for a very long time. The team had to scale this back to just a handful of co-op missions within revolutionary France. The idea of creating your own avatar was scrapped too. This is the root of one of the most infamous news stories surrounding Assassin's Creed Unity, that you couldn't play as a woman within the game because women were a hard to animate. We never explained what actually had happened, McDevitt says. Players were originally supposed to be able to make a male or female avatar, but Arno was going to be the protagonist in the revolutionary France parts of the game. When we had to scale back everything, we realized that meant that everyone would have to play as Arno, even in the multiplayer sections. That meant that you were never going to be able to create your own character, and so you were going to have to play as Arno. When you saw your friends, they were going to be portrayed as generic men, because they couldn't be four Arnos, right? It was a very unfortunate situation where the original plans were scaled back so quickly, but they just had had to use what they had. Though, for the team and many players out in the world, Unity is remembered as a beautiful and ambitious title. For a lot of people, Unity we will call images of a glitchy and broken game. This was in part due to the title's new engine, as well as the crew's sheer ambition when it came to Unity. The game was more or less a reinvention of the franchise, and by Ubisoft's own admission, the team bit off more than it could chew. We learned the hard way that you can't release a massive open world game that is free of bugs, glitches, and so on, as AZ says. We had tried to tackle every single element of game design at the same time. Challenge navigation, parkour, fighting, and the lighting system. Having multiplayer on top of that was way too much. We should have either waited and delayed the game for at least six months in order to be able to offer a game that was quite stable, or we simply should have been a little less ambitious at the release and done something like we had done in the past. The following year, Ubisoft had released a game that was still ambitious in its approach, though it had learned a lot from Unity's development and launch. Notre Dame de Paris Notre Dame de Paris is a jewel of Gothic architecture and one of the most iconic monuments to be featured in Assassin's Creed Unity. The developers attempted to ensure that its rendition in the game would be both beautiful and faithful to the real monument, Caroline Moose, a level artist on Assassin's Creed Unity, spent close to two years modeling the landmark inside and out. Working with historians, she researched every individual area of the cathedral and combed through photos, videos, and architectural plans to create a digital model that was as accurate as possible. After a fire damaged the cathedral in 2019, Ubisoft used the 3D reconstruction of the monument to create a virtual visit in Notre Dame Paris, journey back in time. This free experience allows everyone to visit the cathedral, which as of 2023 is still closed for restoration. The virtual visit offers multiple points of view, some of which were previously inaccessible to the public. The experience ends spectacularly with a hot air balloon flight over the cathedral's arches, set in a lively representation of Paris, as it was in the 18th century. Assassin's Creed Syndicate Though a huge number of Ubisoft studios had contributed to the Assassin's Creed franchise in its first few years, development of nearly all the mainline entries in the series had been led by the company's Montreal studio. That changed with Assassin's Creed Syndicate. With this project, Ubisoft Quebec took the lead. This was a huge step up for the studio. They had worked on the series before, contributing to the likes of Brotherhood and Assassin's Creed 3, but this was their time to shine. We were finishing up the tyranny of King Washington, and there were lots of questions at the studio about what the next big thing would be, Cote remembers. At the time, Ubisoft execs had put on a call for projects, which people could pitch for. There was a ton of ideas for the future of the franchise. People were saying that we should go into casual, mobile, or multiplayer games. So one day I said, I wanted to participate in the pitch process, 
I put on a suit and met with the execs to pitch them as to why Quebec should take the leadership role in the Assassin's Creed franchise. I told them that the next step for us as a studio was to build a full game. <clears throat> Though Ubisoft Quebec had proved itself in the past, management was not entirely on board with this idea, but they entertained Cote and he had the chance to meet with the franchise executive producer Sebastian Puel in Montreal at the end of 2012. He was a great ally for the studio over the years, Cote says. I pitched the idea to him and he thought it was fantastic. The one thing we were missing was a world-class producer for the project. To fill that role, the team had brought in Francois Pellin. By April 2013, the Quebec studio was given the mandate to build the next entry in the Assassin's Creed franchise, due for, for release in 2015. If Unity was Assassin's Creed 2.0, Syndicate was to be Assassin's Creed 2.5, as AZ explains. The idea was that it should be basically be what Brotherhood was to Assassin's Creed 2. Pula told Cote that he had a blank check when it came to this game's setting. It could be anywhere the team wanted. The Quebec studio looked into a few different possibilities, including the Napoleonic Wars, but the team eventually landed on Industrial Revolution London, a decision that management had wanted all along. So unbeknownst to me, there had been a master plan, Cote laughs. Unity and Syndicate were thought about as the revolution's phase. After the French Revolution in Unity, the next logical step would have been Industrial Revolution London. I didn't know that, yet I ended up choosing exactly that. As for why Quebec decided on London during the Industrial Revolution, there was a pretty simple answer. London felt very attractive as the capital of the world at that time, Cote explains. There were a bunch of important historical characters. For example, Marx and Darwin, all in London at pretty much the same time. Jack the Ripper was also on the horizon, too. So Victorian London really felt like it was a black hole. We felt pulled toward it. It was too much of a pivotal moment of history to be ignored. Transport for London. Though city settings were nothing new to the Assassin's Creed franchise, London in the Industrial Revolution was unlike any setting that the series had done before. For one, this was the dawn of mass transportation. It felt like there was an opportunity for the studio to introduce some really innovative gameplay with a kind of steampunk feeling to the era, Cote says. I really wanted to increase the player's mobility around the city. That's why we ended up investing in creating transportation systems, like trains, buses, and boats on the river, Thames. That was super great to build. Introducing vehicles into Assassin's Creed Syndicate's tech was a technical feat, not only for getting all these systems to work, but also due to the sense of speed they brought about. Putting those vehicles into the Anvil engine was the challenge of a lifetime for the engineers, Cote says. Until that point, the fastest that we had traveled around the world was on a horse. Then we had trains. We were moving at 75 kilometers per hour, which was very, very demanding on the loading systems with all the crowds. In a game like Forza, you probably went around a track at something like 200 kilometers per hour, but that game was obviously built with different things in mind. There are so many things going on in an Assassin's Creed game, so the faster you move, the more challenging it is for the engine especially. One of Syndicate's other big changes was the ability for the player to be on a surface that was moving. This might not sound like much, but in game development terms it was a huge deal. The character could go and jump on a platform that was moving, and then still do everything that they could do before and then climb down, as AZ explains. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given Singapore's proficiency when it came to water tech, Quebec called upon this studio to recreate London's River Thames. Where before, Singapore had either been creating naval sections in isolation or in an open world where water was prevalent, bringing this tech into someone else's open world was a change of pace. <clears throat> the mandate that had been decided on, which also tied into the technological breakthrough that Quebec wanted for Syndicate, was the ability to parkour on fast-moving platforms, Louis explains. That meant a bustling Thames with lots of barges that the team could use to create gameplay that was set on fast-moving barges. They were also making the river itself, but the technical budgets were very different as this was in the middle of an open-world city. That had been a new challenge for the tech team. Rather than creating something highly innovative that affected gameplay like they did on Assassin's Creed 3 and Black Flag, their job was creating a bustling river within a city that needed to render and do other things in order to recreate a realistic river. Industrial Revolution London is a setting that has been done to death through popular culture. <clears throat>
close your eyes, and you're probably thinking of the de desolation of Oliver Twist, suit-covered orphans fighting for life in a grim, dark world. Quebec wanted to recreate this feeling in places, but to also show a different side of this time period. It's still a game that I love going back to, Cote says. The London we created was breathtaking. We did capture the gritty and smoke-filled atmosphere of the Industrial Revolution, but we also showcased a London that wasn't dark. There were some very beautiful and sunny moments in the environment. One of the team's fears from the beginning was that we would build something that was very dark, and that wasn't something we wanted to do. If you think about it, if someone is going to spend 30 to 40 hours in a game, you don't want the atmosphere to be entirely oppressive. That's why we hope to challenge what people thought about industrial London and build a place that had a lot of contrasts. At the time of writing, Syndicate is the closest that the Assassin's Creed franchise has been to the present day. This had its advantages. For instance, the architecture of a city like industrial London was more similar to modern day London compared to other games. There are a lot of buildings from that era that still exist in London, Thierry Denerso, the art director and Syndicate and Odyssey explains. The Industrial Revolution wasn't much more than 150 years ago, so we had to make sure to depict the city properly. London was also a much more modern city than many <clears throat> than Ubisoft had depicted in the past. For one, large portions of the city featured taller buildings than the company had previously recreated. We faced the issue of adding buildings that were five stories high, Dan Sorrell explains. That's why we introduced the rope launcher. Sometimes it took too long to climb buildings. In many ways, the Industrial Revolution was the perfect setting for an Assassin's Creed game. Not only was it a pivotal moment in history, but it also played well into the franchise's themes of liberation versus tyranny. There were stark power dynamics in how the people of London retreated. Many were living in slums, working in factories under the iron rule of industrialists who wanted to squeeze every ounce of labor from them. How this played out in different parts of London was something the narrative team wanted to explore. This was a period of great modernization in British culture, Yoho Lem explains. Each of the districts had a theme around a different form of modernization, like transportation, science, or invention. Cote adds, we wanted to exaggerate the differences a little bit between all the various districts. If the contrast had been too subtle, players might not have noticed it. I remember building places that had a real gritty and industrial kind of feeling, where you could see people going to work at the factories and traveling toward the richer districts. We wanted to accomplish this depiction of inequality better than what we had done in the past. Because to me, it felt like the Industrial Revolution was one of the moments in history where you could clearly see this stark separation between the rich and the poor. There are a few ways that the team attempted to indicate these distinctions between the richer and poor areas of London. We played with the notion of scale and spacing, Dancero says. The richer the area was, the larger the spaces were. The poorer the area was, the narrower the streets were. When you're in an impoverished area, you don't feel safe. You can't see far ahead. It's claustrophobic because everything is close together. But when it's a richer area, there's a park, there's trees, there's vegetation, there's a place to breathe. The Industrial Revolution setting also gave the team some design goalposts to aim for. There were people who made a lot of money in London. Some titans of industry even became wealthier than the Queen, to answer. We embraced the idea of marketing by putting ads on buildings. Those elements were really fun. It was super interesting to work on the facades of buildings. He continues, since it was the Industrial Revolution, one of our goals was for there to always be something moving on screen, smoke, cars, and so on, just to embrace that it was a time of motion, just the two of us. This time around, Syndicate had not one but two protagonists for its narrative, in the twins, Jacob and Evie Fry. Much like Arnold's story, in Unity, this game had a very personal tale. I was focused on Jacob and Evie and making them into likable and interesting heroes with an arc, Yoholam says. They were dealing with the death of their father. It was very exciting from a writing perspective because we started with this idea that their father had just died off camera before the game even began. They're then dancing around that subject the entire game. It's a game about loss, growth, and how you react to that loss. Both Jacob and Evie have very different reactions, so you're playing through this transformative period of grief in their lives. It isn't directly referenced very often, but this tragic event that occurred right before the game began is really at its center. The contrast between Jacob's and Evie's personalities 
isn't just confined to the narrative either. It carries over into the gameplay and how they handle specific situations. For example, Jacob prefers brute force, while Evie is more focused on stealth. Jacob would always charge in and try to fix things with force, without really thinking about the consequences, Yohalem remembers. And then Evie would come in afterward and discover that despite Jacob's interference, things had not improved in that district, even though the Templars were gone. So Evie would figure out a long-term solution that would really aid in the progress of society. This process would then be repeated according to the theme of each particular district. Given its gangland setting, Syndicate also revised how combat worked in Assassin's Creed. This time around, Jacob and Evie weren't wielding swords, but rather more low-key weaponry. The fighting system was grittier and more violent, Azazia says. You didn't really have swords in London. There weren't really a lot of weapons around. So the player could use things like a cane, brass knuckles, and daggers. That was it. Though it had, at times, a grim and oppressive setting, Johan wanted the story to have a lighter feeling in contrast. When I'm writing, there's a feeling that the words communicate, he explains. It's almost like a color that you see. I wanted to make it fresh. I wanted it to be a comedy. I thought it would be fun to do a buddy comedy in Victorian London because I thought that was not the norm. It's a high stakes comedy. I had been watching a movie, something similar to 22 Jump Street, and I thought we could do that in Victorian London. I think that's where we escape some of the cliches of period pieces. This was a story of two undercover cops who had a relationship with each other, who were navigating these bizarre situations together and trying to get to a hidden villain. As well as being the first time that the Assassin's Creed franchise had had two playable characters for the bulk of its story, Syndicate is also the first mainline entry in the series to have a female protagonist, Evie Fry. One of my first creative objectives when starting out Syndicate in early 2013 was for Evie to have a very important place in the game, Kote says. This is something that we felt passionately about. We wanted the game to build on some of the grains that we had made in terms of inclusiveness and representation with projects like Freedom Cry. To me, she had to be playable in the open world. In the end, gameplay was roughly split two-thirds to one-third between Jacob and Evie. One of the reasons why this was a challenge was due to the tech-powering syndicate. It was a huge endeavor in terms of production, Kote explains. It was the first time we had two fully playable characters in our open world, and the engine wasn't really built to be able to support that. The easy thing would have been to make Evie a secondary character. However, I remembered working with Jeffrey, and we wanted to build this kind of buddy cop comedy between Jacob and Evie. In order to design the Fry Twins look, the team had to go against many of the tenets of the franchise. The duo were decked out in leather coats that gave more of a rock star kind of impression. We felt it made no sense to have a person dressed in a white assassin's robe, Dance Rogue says, and it also made no sense to be the only guy with a hood up in a Victorian crowd, so that's why we decided to go with the hat. But when Jacob was being stealthy, he put his hood on. He continues, We could have designed an assassin to be part of the upper class, but we had decided to go the other way around and have them rebel against the upper class, those industrialists who were ruling the world. So we decided to fully embrace that rebel aspect, especially for Jacob. They were rebels fighting against the system. <coughs> that was a fun angle. That's why we gave them those leather coats. It felt like we gave Jacob and Evie a sort of rock and roll appearance. It was such a good approach from a visual standpoint. As mentioned before, Syndicate is the nearest that Assassin's Creed has come to the present. When it came to designing combat, that posed some interesting questions. We had to challenge ourselves in how we were going to use or represent guns and other modern weapons, as Asia says. There was a big leap in time between Unity and Syndicate, but we wanted to avoid giving the main characters guns because we didn't want the game to end up being like Grand Theft Auto or Watch Dogs Syndicate. As well, Syndicate, as with all Assassin's Creed games, was really about getting up close and personal and using the weaponry that you had that allowed us to play with these restrictions with respect to the gameplay. Going solo. Like Unity and Assassin's Creed games going back to Brotherhood, Syndicate was initially meant to have a multiplayer component. The team had huge ambitions for that part of the game, but it ended up being cut because the engine just couldn't properly handle that kind of gameplay. It was an unhappy moment in the history of the franchise, Kote remembers. The technical foundations of multiplayer mode were shaky, and it was very difficult to iterate and improve upon. 
With the new engine, it took two to three times longer to build anything that it had previously in order to support multiplayer components. Our iteration time was pretty much killed. The saddest part was that we had to completely drop that feature, and you haven't seen it return in the franchise. That was actually a big loss. As was always the case, the multiplayer mode was intended to be an iteration or evolution on the systems from previous Assassin's Creed games. Unity had introduced co-op gameplay into the franchise, so the intent was for Syndicate to take this up a notch. The pitch was to build more co-op missions, Kote says. We wanted to have some kind of a full co-op campaign. That felt like the natural next step after Unity. That part of the game was created at Ubisoft Montreal. So Unity had co-op missions and raids. The plan was to use the multiplayer system from Unity, along with the online tech to do our own version of that for Syndicate, Bergeron says. We worked on a proposal for what this online component could be like in Montreal for about six months. Part of the plan was to have raids using this linear gameplay sequence philosophy to allow players to go to different parts of England to do heists with other people. Ultimately, that was scrapped because of scope and time. One of the reasons that the multiplayer feature was cut from Syndicate was the Quebec studio's focus on vehicles in the game. Recreating these systems proved too difficult for multiplayer. We had prototypes for multiplayer mode, Cote says. It all came down to one point where we realized that the tech just wouldn't stretch to have these citywide vehicles, carriages, and all this gameplay that we thought was essential for a better single-player game. So we had what I would say was the internal industry conundrum of whether we would build a great single-player game or an average single-player game with a multiplayer component. We chose to build a great single-player game and put all our money, investment, and effort there. I still consider it unfortunate that we ended up obliterating the entire network stack in the process to optimize and focus Syndicate. Despite being a fresh take on the Assassin's Creed franchise, Syndicate was far from the strongest selling title in the series to date. In its first two years on sale, the game sold just 5.5 million copies. That's not to say that Ubisoft Quebec let the company down. Far from it. The team did a stellar job with Syndicate and proved themselves worthy of leading an Assassin's Creed project. Speculation suggested that this was a knock-on effect from the negative reception that Unity had received 12 months earlier, while some felt that the consumers were tired of annual entries in the franchise. Assassin's Creed was Ubisoft's biggest IP by a mile. Something drastic was needed to change the story. To do so, the company decided to go back to the beginning. And that is Chapter 4 of the making of Assassin's Creed 15th anniversary. Join us next time for Chapter 5, Ancient Assassination.